Welcome back to Kentucky Route Zero. We've just visited the strangers in the church and come away with a phrase that we can enter into Xanadu to apparently fix it. Well, I say apparently like I haven't already played through this section before. <laughs> it will fix it. Let's enter it. Okay. We're supposed to type dome in air. Weird. Just following instructions. Here we go. The whole aesthetic of this machine is just so cool. At end of road. You are standing at the end of a road before a small brick building. Around you is a forest. Check out the building. Enter building. So this is, uh, well, it's basically a text adventure. Which I believe Donald did mention something about, uh, like, didn't they say fellow, like, uh, I forgot the exact word, but fellow text adventure enthusiast or something like that. You're inside a building, a storage shed for the National Park Service. There's a sensible, modern electric lantern nearby. Get the lantern. I love the music. It's like morphed and sort of half corrupted music, but you can still hear the melody. Taken. Exit building. Enter forest. That's not something you can enter. Just type a direction. North. In forest. You're in open forest with a deep valley to one side. Can we climb a tree? I don't think much is to be achieved by that. Sorry. Can we dig a hole? You can't see any such thing. Pretty limited vocabulary. South. You're in forest. Hey, it's a maze. Let's go east. You're in forest. Lula is here, soldering replacement components in a small handmade radio. Let's talk to her. Hi, Donald. I'm getting the strangest interference out here. I've been tuning the radio circuits gradually as we go, swapping capacitor values and tweaking resistor networks. It was working for a while, but... Everything I can pick up sounds so distant and muffled. Lula hands you the radio. Well, maybe you'll have better luck. You're good at this stuff. Just don't forget to give it back. Let's go further east. You're in forest. Joseph is here, tapping with a small stylus on a modified pocket braille slate. A small gray kitten, no more than a few weeks old, dozes comfortably on top of his backpack. Yeah, so there were 
three architects of Xanadu. I'm pretty sure Donald mentioned this before. The three architects are Donald, Lula, and Joseph. And remember when we were walking up here, on the pathway up here, we found a pet carrier, we found some punch cards, we found a backpack, we found some, like, cat food or something. So that must have been Joseph's. Because they have a small gray kitten, or had a small gray kitten, dozing on their backpack. So I'm pretty sure that was Joseph's stuff. Maybe he has something to say. Donald, I was just transcribing your footsteps. Sounded like... Joseph runs his finger along the index card he's been tapping on, from right to left. Long, weary song, drearily gone, dearly gone. You beat a melancholy shuffle through those woods, Donald. I've been noting down the sounds of the forest, with an ear for speech, and an inborn filter for poetry, I suppose. So maybe it's me being melancholy after all. I'm eager to see what the poetic subsystem makes of these punched cards. East. Edge of hole. You are at the edge of a massive hole. The dirt gives way to rock as the ground sinks into darkness. The computer tied to your upper back slickens with sweat in the afternoon sun. The rope slung around your shoulder has slipped under the strap of your backpack, digging uncomfortably against your collarbone. Shine the lamp into the hole. Your lamp is now on. Shine lamp and hole. The lamplight only reaches a few yards down the hole, where the rock is coated in a slimy black mold. You can tell that the walls are too slick to climb safely without assistance. Try using the rope to climb down safely. Tie rope to tree. The rope is tied snugly to a tree trunk. Down. Your feet slip a few times on the slimy rock, but you remain stable. Lula and Joseph descend carefully after you. In Bed Quilt You're in bed quilt, a long east-west passage, with holes everywhere. Joseph and Lula remove the computer equipment they are carrying on their backs and begin setting up. That's the last trip, so everything's down here now. Set up the gear. I only understood you as far as wanting to set the up above. To set the up above? What? Set the up above? Lula looks pensive. Ask her about the cave. Having second thoughts? I don't blame you. It's unsettling down here. Weird acoustics. Earlier, as we were climbing down, I thought I heard voices for a moment. Or, not voices themselves, but... The echoes of voices, singing, some kind of eerie, tuneless working song. I'm glad I'm not down here alone. What's the gear they're carrying? Sure, Donald. We may as well take inventory. I've got the tape machine and the synthesizer parts we borrowed from the School of Music. It's all tuned up to my voice, so we won't have to type so much. Joseph has his slate and the punch cards he's transcribed from the poems we read him. He's got the typewriter and the paper tape reader. And you've got the CRT display. How's your back holding up? <laughs> yeah, CRTs are friggin' heavy. Joseph looks uncomfortable. Jealous. 
Hey, Donald. Can you help me, uh, wire up these generators? I'll assemble the synthesizer, but I could use some help with the serial interface if you have time. You hear an unfamiliar echo from a tunnel to the east. Maybe if we help Lula, she'll have more to tell us. Thanks, Donald. I can never remember which color lead goes to which pin. Lula begins unpacking a box of wires and terminals. Do you think there are paintings down here? Cave paintings, I mean. Maybe some old pottery shards from when the world was young and early men and women huddled in these caves to... Do you know, I think cultural fossils are the saddest fossils. Sadder than animal remains, I mean. We might come across a petrified mollusk or a partial dinosaur footprint, and we say there was a point of contact here where a body touched the earth, and maybe there's a little bit of evidential garbage, but the life who owned that body never cared and has moved on anyway. And that's the end of it. But suppose I shine my lantern on one of these walls, and I see a crude painting, thousands of years old, two men and a woman, charcoal and blood, on rock. Someone put that there to keep something on the rock after she passed. A hope, a relationship, or a moment. A worry, maybe. A regret. She made a painting to keep something alive for her, but like that dead mollusk and that itinerant dinosaur, she had to move on. Whatever it was is gone. And now we're looking at this painting, this dangling copy with no original. You were interrupted by the ominous echo of a grating, scraping sound from the east, louder than before. What the hell was that? Let's check it out. You rush down the tunnel with Joseph and Lula close behind. That got kind of intense back there. No wonder they're still thinking about it. The tunnel narrows, and soon you find yourself crawling on your hands and knees. Navigating the tunnel gradually becomes more awkward, as smooth rock gives way to jagged, crystalline surfaces. So notice we're talking about smooth rock giving way to crystal. Just like, well, similar to what Donald mentioned when they were telling us how to get to the strangers. They said rock gives way to crystal and then that gives way to mud. Scratches and taps echo from the end of the tunnel, some short and piercing, some slower and groaning as if dampened by water. The tunnel opens into a large room. In Crystal Room. You're in a large, irregular chamber. The walls, floor, and ceiling are covered with crystalline projections. Strangers are here, scraping black mold from the crystals. They look up when you enter. One of them seems about to speak. Finally! Let's listen to what he says. The stranger reaches for a box he's carrying and presses a plastic button. The box whirs to life, and a crackly voice blurts something unintelligible, then slows to a deep gurgle. He looks at his companions momentarily in confused disappointment. Then he returns his awful gaze to you. Joseph flees through a tunnel to the north. Lula flees through a tunnel to the northeast. Let's follow Joseph. Joseph scrambles across outcrops of crystal as you struggle to follow him in the dark. He calls back breathlessly. What? 
What happened to Lula? Lula, are you back there? Uh, stay and look for her. You can't see any such thing. Donald, you have to find her. Make sure you find her. Joseph climbs through the cave into the darkness. Look for Lula. You can't see any such thing. The strangers return to their work, scraping the crystals. There's no sign of Lula now. You should leave. Back in bed quilt. You're in bed quilt along East West Passage. Yep. Joseph is here, panting for breath. Damn. Did they follow us? Where's Lula? Uh, search for her. I only understood you as far as wanting to search. Uh, we have to be more specific. Um, back outside? You grab hold of the rope and slowly climb up. Your days lecturing on esoteric computer science topics did not prepare you to scale cave walls with rope. Your evenings gathering with friends to roll dice and consult fancifully illustrated charts, however, prepared you for the likelihood that this climb could end badly. You carefully descend back into the cave. With the equipment? The various computer and audio equipment casts angular shadows into the tunnels as you scan slowly across the pile. Nothing. Lula emerges suddenly from one of the tunnels. Is it you? Or more shadows? Lula advances carefully. It... It really is you, isn't it? I got lost out there in the tunnels. For a while I thought I was running in circles or some kind of labyrinth. Every rocky wall and floor looked the same. Finally, I ended up here. I hid out for a bit, waiting for you. I heard voices, but I wasn't sure, not after what I've seen. While I was out there, I spent some time on the Zero. What? Why? Joseph, it's... it's different than we've heard. It's like a real place. They pick up garbage, they deliver mail, they go to work and to church. My most vivid memory is a parade of images, like a walking dream or a slide lecture I'll never understand. A television, a scarecrow, a crystal, a feather, a sandwich, a CRT monitor, a bottle, an anchor. Joseph seems agitated. We should ask her more about it. It's calling to me, Donald. It seems important. Important? It's... It doesn't matter now, damn it. I'm leaving. To hell with all of it. Get him back on track, we're so close. Divert Joseph's attention. You shout, shout something at Joseph about the project you are working on together. You'll die in these damn cold caves. And what about those men? You know they'll come back. Tell him we can hide from the strangers. You shout something at Joseph about going deeper into the caves. Did you hear their voices? They're not... They'll find you. But not me. I'm going back to the surface. Stop! Your stupid fight is ringing through the whole damned cave. Joseph is right. We can't stay here. I'm leaving too. But I'm not going back to the surface. I'm taking my station wagon and I'm heading down the zero. I think we need her to stay. You plead with Lula about your continued collaboration. I'll send you this tape when I'm done recording. I'll put it in the mail, and then you can see what your damned machine does with it. So I'm wondering, just the same as I was wondering last time when I recorded this, what tape, what is Lula recording exactly? Something that they're going to put into the machine, see what it does with it, of course, but, but what? 
And this is obviously a uh, sort of simulation, a text adventure, I guess, version of what actually happened. Because Lula is, or was, in the Zero. I mean, we last saw Lula in the Zero at the Bureau of Reclaimed Spaces. So Lula decided, or Lula thought there was something important about the Zero after spending some time in there. A very short amount of time, right? I mean, Lula wasn't gone for more than... I don't know, I mean, Donald had time to climb the rope, come back down, search the equipment, and then that was it, so... I don't know, like five minutes max? Unless maybe time on the Zero does not mean the same thing that time outside the Zero does? But anyway, these caves. So, are the caves on Earth? Like, are the caves real? But then the strangers are like crystalline projections? I don't know. Lula and Joseph have left. In tunnels. Abandoned by your collaborators, your confidants, your companions, the only two among your colleagues with whom you've ever trusted the gift of your friendship. Pretty thick. Sounds like Beardo had his heart broken. You wander the tunnels alone, dragging along the components of your unrealized masterpiece, combing the underground passages for a new site in which to realize your vision. Sounds like a genius. How do you mean? Vain. Vanity. Ain't it the truth? My Aunt Remedios, before she got into the whole ethnomusicog musicography thing. She was a painter. Mostly nudes and oil. She had this model. I'll never forget him. Big, classically physical guy. It looked like he was about to storm Troy. He made everyone call him the Colonel. Weaver and I saw this guy naked a lot. You couldn't help it. He was always posing somewhere in the house, chasing the light from room to room while Entremedios made a sketch of his profile or worked on the right mix of pigments for his abdomen. Every time I say Remedios, I keep thinking, like, am I pronouncing that right? Because I'm pronouncing it as if it's, like, Remedial, Remedial, Remedios. It's probably pronounced differently. Remedios? I don't know. Remedios sounds better. The colonel had this magnificent hair, long black hair that ran down just at the bottom of his shoulder blades. One evening, he was standing next to an open window in the back of the house. The sun was setting. Early spring, I think. It was kind of windy. Aunt Remedios was trying to get his hair right. She kept arranging it, like half in front and half behind, running over his shoulder and laying across his chest in this very specific way. But it itched, itched him or something, and he'd do this weird indignant shuffle thing, or the wind from the open window would push it around, or he'd start and turn his neck when Weaver or I ran by, and everything would be tangled again. The final product was a swirl of black lines, billowing around the top of his neck. Weird thing is, I don't even remember his face now. Just that black swirl. Probably the best one she ever painted. Hall of the Mountain King, which is where we're at now. After what may have been years, you stumble out of a tunnel into a cavernous open space. Stalactites adorn the ceiling like grotesques. In the center of the room is an enormous rocky spire. This is where you set up your equipment and establish your legacy. Now is the time to continue your work. 
Research Assistance, 0. Realism Index, 37%. Romance Index, 2%. Mold Coverage, 0%. You may hire a new research assistant, assign assistance to a task, or sleep until tomorrow. Yeah, so this is really interesting. It's like this little mini game, but it obviously reflects what we've actually seen happen, and you'll see why in just a second. So we've kind of caught up to the point where Donald entered this cave system and started to establish their legacy. I guess they started to make Xanadu at this point? Or maybe they had already been working on it beforehand. I'm not sure. But let's hire a new research assistant. Uploading job advertisement to university message boards. You have hired Rick, who studies library sciences. Now, maybe you don't recognize Rick. In fact, I don't even specifically remember Rick, but all these people that you hire are the people that you could talk to around the, the spire. So like, uh, what was her name? Like the, what was it Rebecca or something? It wasn't Rebecca. Ah, you'll see the others. Um, so you can only hire one a day. Let's assign them to something. So I can assign them to debugging, transcription, or speculation. Let's go with debugging first. I've only got the one research assistant. Now we have to sleep. Time passes. Rick identifies a bug with the oxygen level simulation, but is unable to fix it. Now is the time to continue your work. One research assistant. Okay. Realism, I think, is the same. Romance has gone down from 2% to 0%, and mold coverage is up from 0% to 10%. So, let's hire a new one. Same thing, university message boards. Greg, who studies architecture. So, let's put one research assistant on debugging. And let's put the other research assistant on transcription, whatever that means. And we'll sleep. Greg widens tunnels slightly to reduce the need for extra crouch commands. Rick summarizes the migratory patterns of bats through the tunnels. Greasy black mold is collecting on the computer equipment. Okay, so realism's gone up to 62%, romance still at zero, mold coverage advancing to 19%. Let's get another one. Let's see, is this the interesting, the particularly interesting research assistant that I'm thinking of? Yes! You have hired Weaver, who studies mathematics. So, Weaver, Shannon's sibling, worked, or perhaps still works, for Donald. I guess worked, because they're not here anymore. Very interesting. Okay, let's get an even amount on each thing, I guess. We'll put one on debugging. Oh. Well, I guess we're putting two on debugging. My bad. Can't back out of that menu. And we'll put the final one on speculation. And we'll sleep. Weaver fixes some weird math with some weirder math. Rick makes adjustments to the echolocation algorithms. Bats now fly normally instead of getting hung up on each other's wings and clustering together like horrible leathery tumbleweeds. <laughs> Greg discards centuries of exhaustive data on the uniformity of cause and effect. Intruders. The strangers are doing something to the equipment, but you can't make out what. You can see them back there behind Xanadu. You hide behind a rock until they leave. With trepidation, you emerge from your hiding place hours later. I'm not convinced this is getting us any closer to the zero. Realism Index. 67, Romance, 5%, Mold Coverage, 0%. So, let's stop for a second. So 
something that is probably pretty obvious now, but becomes super obvious later on, is that the strangers, they come every time the mold gets to a certain percentage. Every time it collects enough, the strangers come, they mine it or collect it or whatever with it, and when they leave, there's no mold left. They're harvesting the mold, the strangers. And as far as we can tell, they don't seem to be doing anything violent at all. They haven't done anything violent. They haven't threatened us. Obviously, everybody's terrified of them, but they haven't done anything bad, and all they've done is take away the mold, which sounds like a good thing, right? So I'm not at all convinced that the strangers are anything bad. But what are they? Strange crystalline figures that want mold. And remember, it mentioned they sounded sort of like, or at least from a distance, it sounded sort of like these worker songs, these worker noises were echoing through the tunnels. Sort of like tuneless worker songs along with the sounds of their tools. They sound like miners, don't they? Like, is there some connection between the strangers and the miners? Like, you know, the mine that we visited and the fact that Johnny and Junebug used to work in a mine, if not that specific mine that we went to? I feel like there's some sort of connection. They're very similar. It's strange. Yeah, so when I, when I played this section before... Uh, I spent a lot of time on this, I guess, minigame or whatever you'd call this. Just hiring your research assistants and assigning them to things and just waiting for the strangers to come and just the cycle went over and over and over again. Um, so you can try to quit and start over. I never pressed that. I always pressed ahead until something eventually happened. It just took a long time for anything unique to happen. So I'm going to continue doing what I was doing before, what I did last time, which is just... just going forwards and trying to get my realism, romance, and everything up to 100%. Because I assume you're trying to get those as high as possible, I guess. And I just try to achieve it by kind of somewhat evenly assigning all the people to the different categories. So I'm going to continue to do that. And what will happen is occasionally there'll be like a little unique tidbit that'll come up and I'll bring you back for those. So here's something interesting. I just slept, and very shortly after we hired Weaver, Weaver follows the strangers into the tunnels. She doesn't return, but neither do they. Isn't that strange? So yeah, Weaver did disappear and is no longer working on the project. In fact, they didn't seem to stay in more than a couple days. So... If Weaver has, I guess, joined the strangers, and we've seen Weaver outside the Zero. Is that the land of the strangers that we've been driving in? The overworld? I don't know. A mail carrier on bicycle brings you a sizable bill from the power company. You prepare a nutritional meal of boiled cave moss, seasoned with a salty, translucent paste you've harvested, at great personal risk, from stalactites. You dream fitfully. You, Lula, and Joseph stand in a hallway. The walls are blank beige. It's just after winter quarter, but before spring, so there are no students around. Joseph says something clever, and Lula leans on his shoulder. You wish that instead she had taken your hand, or that there were any other option. Your habit of absent-mindedly chipping away at cave crystals and sprinkling their dust in the air behind you has paid off. Just a few feet down one of the tunnels blooms a small but kaleidoscopic garden of crystals. Research assistants come and go. You don't encounter the strangers again, but sometimes you can hear the uncanny echoes of their voices off in the tunnels. Years pass, mold accumulates. You and the remaining research assistants take to burning disused equipment in the center of the room. The black mold is intensely flammable and makes an excellent catalyst. It leaves behind a sweet, narcotic perfume. 
Remember that Donald was actually smoking the mold in their pipe. I guess because it's narcotic. One night, you have visitors, outsiders, different ones. Then, later that night, an old friend, Lula. You really did go deeper into the caves. Premature end of file. Press any key to quit. Huh. And just as Anadu mentioned that Lula, an old friend, stops by. Look at that. There's Lula. Okay, so this is the point where I had stopped recording before, so everything past this point is completely unknown to me. So, thank God. <laughs> That's over. Never again will that happen. Yeah, I am very intrigued by Xanadu. It's, it's such a strange blurring of reality, like I have no idea what's real. It seems to, seems to have been describing things that have already happened, but also things that will happen, like the fact that Lula just appeared here. So it's almost like we're living in the simulation, but we're looking at the simulation while in the simulation? How is that even possible? And then the strangers, who are they, and what happened when we encountered them in the church, and they told us what to do to fix Xanadu? How come Conway has a leg that looks like it's it's like a crystalline projection, just like what the strangers look like? And everything in Xanadu looks like that. I don't know, but I'm intrigued. So, I hope you've enjoyed so far. And when I return, we're going to speak with Lula and Donald. <laughs>